It all started the moment when I met him in uh, his practice, Palm Springs. My prosthetic, my career as a prosthetic urologist, and uh, my patient's happiness, and me and my self's happiness as well. Uh, he taught me, and he guided me, and he raised me as a prosthetic urology and helped me up. And uh, so far, I am. I'm now here all because of him. I can say that. When I had the first training with him, and uh, I had uh, several trainings with him, of course, but after all those training ends, before I leave his practice, I asked him, Dr. Wilson, how can I, because you know, he was, has no compensation from the, nor from the company about my training, you know, no from the company or uh, nor from me, so he was doing it for free, I'll say. So I asked him, how can I repay this debt, Papa? No, oh, back then I was asking him, calling him Dr. Wilson. So I, how can I repay this debt, debt Dr. Wilson? So he told me back, told me back that, uh, uh, Sean, make me proud of you. Oof. Oh, well, uh, when you hear uh, some words like that, your parents tell, saying, to you that, uh, son, make me proud. How, <laughs> how hard it can be is, uh, you know, unimaginable. So that's maybe the reason why I still trying to do my best to make him proud of me. Uh, and uh, I thank him for that kind of wisdom so that I can, you know, keep doing what I'm doing now. So he gave me everlasting flame into my heart named as a, you know, a huge debt toward them. He taught me how to live as a prosthetic urologist, not just my job, you know. Um, he taught me how to live the life itself. And uh, as I had to start all by myself in my country, um, he guided me and raised me uh, whenever I had a trouble. So he just did not tell me how to do the surgery, but how to live a life itself. And all thanks to his wisdom, I was able to sur survive all those, you know, uh, difficult times. And now I'm here to say that uh, uh, I'm doing one of the most cases outside of the U.S. Uh, for the pe penal process surgery. Um, he means a lot of things to me, not just a teacher, mentor, uh, he's a father figure to me. Uh, that's, that's why I call him as a papa. So he fathered me to be who I am now. Thank you so much, Papa, for raising me so far. And I still need your guidance, of course. Don't ditch me up uh, until, <laughs> until I'm well fully grown up. And uh, no, please be with us forever so that I can learn more from him and guide us forevermore. Well, uh, as you now uh, have, you know, uh, awarded, properly awarded, so I can say that long live the legend. Well, I, I didn't really dedicate my life to treating erectile dysfunction. I started out as a general urologist, and, uh, but then I had a focus in erectile dysfunction. And back in the 70s, uh, when I started, uh, we didn't have any pills, we didn't have any shots, we didn't have vacuum devices, uh, we didn't have any treatment at all. And then the penile prosthesis came out in 1973, and I did my first one in 74. Uh, so that's 44 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and you know, through the 70s, I might do one every two months. And then in the 80s, it really caught fire. And then uh, in the 90s, uh, we had the other therapies come along. And so I became uh, an impotent specialist. Uh, and not only the penile prosthesis, but all the other forms of therapy. Actually, at my age and my position, I don't really learn a great deal. Uh, I, and I come to these conferences because I'm an invited guest. And like this conference, I had five different uh, 
talks that I had to give. Mm -hmm. So I prepare for those talks, and and then I watch the other other speakers, and occasionally, you know, I pick up a tip or a trick. And this happened to be a, a particularly good conference, uh, and the program is excellent. Uh, I come really to teach more than I come to learn, but you always learn something. Well, I mean, uh, when, when you've done more than anybody in the world, uh, you have experience and lessons to be learned. And so it's nice that I can continue to come and, and pass on those lessons because the younger guys, if they hear it, maybe they won't have the same mistakes that I made. Well, you know, actually, uh, I just had one uh, right before I came. And uh, I put the, put the device in this individual, and uh, they were unable to urinate. So I put a catheter in for a couple of days. And, yeah. and, uh, but, you know, because you have cylinders in there and you have the catheter in the urethra, it's not a good thing. So I took the catheter out. He was still not able to empty his bladder. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took a telescope with a TV camera on it and looked throughout the whole thing, couldn't figure out why he was doing this. So now I'm faced with the dilemma of, of having to put the catheter back and worrying about whether it was going to mess up the device. But uh, as old as I am, I remember the old adage, uh, it's not, a, it's not a, a sign of cowardice to ask for advice. Mm -hmm. So I pick up the phone and I called somebody uh, here in the United States, it's like Dr. Park. Mm -hmm. It happened to be a female. She was uh, uh, maybe 40, and I'm 76, and mm -hmm. said, well, what would you do? Yeah. And she gave me the solution, and I didn't even think of it. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the, the most, you know, old people remember things yesterday, but not, not a long time ago. <laughs> Well, you know, interestingly, in this country, because uh, advertising of prescription drugs is is not, I mean, is not illegal. This is probably the only country in the world uh, that allows prescription drugs to be advertised in the media, on TV, in the magazines, and and in the newspapers. And so, while ED uh, was formerly, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, something that was taboo and nobody talked about now it's it's on every tv channel it's in every newspaper so it really doesn't have the same stigma uh, it used to oh the uh the you know the, the greatest thing that i have uh, the thing i take the most pleasure from is the development of young surgeons like dr park uh, who i consider my children well he's a driven man uh he has used his uh, resources to uh, achieve the best training that's possible uh, and he not only uh, got the best training by spending uh, almost a year over here shadowing uh, big-time implanters uh, but uh, even now uh, he's spending a lot of money traveling the world to go to conferences to continue his education so uh, not only does he have excellent surgical skills but because of this dedication to his field he has uh, developed a, an excellent educated mind oh I think my advice would be to get up early and stay late <laughs> I mean you know the uh, uh, you have to have a good work ethic and you have to have thick skin mm -hmm. and uh, it's a tiny, tiny little niche business, and uh, you don't have you don't have very many colleagues because of only a very small percentage of the world's urologists uh, do this tricky, risky surgery. Mm. So uh, hard work and uh, and and man and maintain uh, your network of uh, advisors. Mm. The I mean that's really necessary like I said when you have a very small network of people who are knowledgeable about this tiny little niche of surgery uh, so in order to to uh, get the most out of education and and out of other people's advice uh, you have to maintain a good image in that network and that's why I think so many so many successes on the panel today stress that, that, that uh, you know, you have to roll with the blows and, and be accepting of others' 
mistakes and uh, but continue the network and there's always there's always the 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 desire on the part of the of the physician when he's dealing with a patient that's not doing well mm -hmm. to say that you know he's the things that he is complaining about are all in his head mm -hmm. they're never in his head mm -hmm. there's always a physical reason and mm -hmm. while they may be obnoxious uh, you have to accept the fact that that you did this to him and it, he's your responsibility until he either gets better or gets worse and requires an additional surgery well you know all these years Sean I've been a teacher yes. and uh, a teacher of a tiny tiny little niche of surgery and in order for a student to want to go through the the rigors of education to get good at a tiny little niche of surgery uh, he's got to desire to be like his teacher and if the teacher is successful drives a nice car lives in a nice house wears a nice watch then he the student is more likely to desire to be like his teacher than he is if he doesn't have a coat and tie on and uh, lives in a small house and is not successful.